Okay, wonderful. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have a exciting new event uh, coming up today for you. Uh, we have started this uh, lecture series in on Nobel Prizes in 2011. And since then, every year, one of our faculty members here in the department uh, gives a lecture on that year's physics Nobel Prize for most part, but on several occasions, we have had opportunity to uh, hear on the chemistry Nobel Prize of the year. Uh, we are a little bit behind uh, this time, uh, maybe due to the pandemic, you know, you can blame anything on pandemic these days. Uh, the lecture that we have today is on the 2019 uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry for uh, that was awarded jointly to John B. Gudeno, M. Stanley Whittingham, and Akira Yoshino for the development of lithium ion batteries. And our speaker today is Dr. Babu, and the title of his presentation is Development of Lithium Ion Batteries, Technology That Revolutionalize the Energy Storage. So uh, it, it is indeed a revolution in the energy storage industry. Uh, there is of course a lot of room for uh, new products and new technologies in that arena. Energy storage is still an open problem that is being studied uh, worldwide. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Babu. He's professor of physics uh, in the Department of Physics here at Western. He joined Western in fall of 2008. Uh, he obtained his PhD from a premier research institute in India named Indian Institute of Science. And he served as a visiting fellow at another premier research institute in India named Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. And this was in the late 90s, uh, 1990s. Uh, before coming to Western, Dr. Babu spent a considerable amount of time at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in uh, different institutes and departments there uh, on fabricating and studying nanomaterials, which he continues to do here at Western. Uh, so uh, take it away, Dr. Babu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Kapale. Thank you all for joining with me for this presentation on celebrating the Nobel Prize in chemistry year 2019. So I will start with an outline of my presentation, a very brief introduction to lithium ion batteries. Talk a little bit about basics of the operation of a battery. Move on to rechargeable batteries, lithium metal and its importance. The lithium ion battery, the Nobel Prize winning discovery. I will conclude with a brief look at the, the future outlook for this particular field. Stored electrical energy has become an important part of our daily life. Your cell phone, that amazing tablet that you have, this high resolution, five megapixel digital camera, which you bought a couple of years ago, it must be gathering dust at some corner of your house because these days hardly anybody uses their digital camera. Your dad's favorite handheld tool, your neighbor's amazing hybrid electric car, your dream car, the fully electric Tesla, the latest rover that we send into Mars. Take any of these examples. They all use some form of an efficient energy storage battery for their proper functioning. So these technologies are all made possible by the lithium ion battery. Lithium ion batteries come in all sizes, shapes, and configurations. They have very high potential, high energy density, and high capacity. And lithium ion batteries have literally 
revolutionized the energy storage technology and made tremendous contributions to improving our life. They will continue to do so in the coming years. However, availability of this high capacity, high efficient battery technology did not just happen overnight. There is a long story behind the development of batteries. People knew about the existence of static electricity for quite some time, you know, even looking at phenomena like uh, the huge discharges that you see from clouds, lightning, and the attraction of uh, uh, materials after friction. The ability to recreate that in the lab took quite some time. The earliest effort in this area came from a doctor, an actual physician named Luigi Galvani, Italian medical doctor, graduated from the University of Bologna. So he had carried out some interesting experiments with small animals. The small animal that we are talking about here is a frog. You can see the frog hanging here from that guard rail. When he touched that with a different metal rod, he was able to produce a twitching reaction from the frog. He called it animal electricity. Most of his physician friends were amazed by that. However, if I could borrow the words of our President Joe Biden, the fact of the matter is that that poor animal had nothing much to do with the so-called animal electricity. His fellow countryman and physicist, Alessandro Volta, actually realized that the trick lied with the fact that he used two different metals in this configuration. The frog is hanging from a steel rail guard. The main element of that is iron. And he was actually touching that with a copper rod. So Galvani's initial work in this field actually stimulated Alessandro Volta, who realized that if you use two different metals in the right configuration, you should be able to create electricity out of that. So that is how he designed what is known as the voltaic pile. This consists of alternating disks of zinc and copper separated by cloth soaked in salt water. From your basic electricity magnetism class, you must have seen that when cells are connected in series, like what he has done here, the voltage is added. So when you have such a high pile of large number of zinc and copper cells, it produced a really high voltage. He was able to create electric sparks with this assembly. He took this around Europe, his European tour, of the voltaic pile. When he showed this in front of Napoleon, he was so impressed and Napoleon said, oh, nice pile, Alessandro, here you go, count Volta. Napoleon immediately made him a count. I told you that when you put two dissimilar metals, you know, something interesting happens. Here is what we call the activity series of elements. You can see that various elements are arranged according to their standard reduction potentials. The present hero of our story, lithium, is right there at the bottom of the series. Position of lithium and this number, negative 3.45, are very significant for our discussion. But right now, we will ignore that and we will come back to this later. Understanding basics of a battery is very simple. Any battery consists of three important parts, two electrodes and a medium, what you call the electrolyte. 
In this case, this is a typical Volta cell. You have a negative electrode, which is zinc, and a positive electrode, which is copper. If you look at the uh, series, you can see that zinc is much below copper in this particular series. So when zinc is immersed in this electrolyte solution, it reacts with that, giving up two of its electrons. And those electrons can only go to this other electrode if you provide a contacting path for them. This solution, which you call the electrolyte, it is very good in conducting ions, but it will never let electrons go from this end to that end. So this is what essentially a cell, uh, in a cell what you have. So these electrons for the present discussion, we will treat them as point charge particles. They carry some fundamental electric charge. There is a potential difference between them determined by the difference in their standard uh, reduction potentials. So this is equivalent to setting up an electric field for the electrons between these two electrodes. So they acquire some kinetic energy and that kinetic energy is what we use in making them do electrical work like lighting up a bulb in between. These electrons can collide with atoms of the tungsten in the filament of that, excite those atoms, they don't stay in their excited state for a long time. They come back by emitting photons, which we call the light. So there has to be a porous membrane that will allow for the mutual transport of ions between these two chambers so that charge neutrality is maintained. So in this type of an electric battery, the battery will continue its operation as long as you have zinc atoms left on the negative electrode. Once the zinc atoms are all consumed, the battery will stop working. So that reason, this battery was known as a primary battery. It's not rechargeable. But we are interested in rechargeable batteries. All of you know that by birth, all batteries are bipolar, but as I mentioned, you know, we really would like to, them to be rechargeable. So how does a rechargeable battery work? The same electrochemical reaction, which you have seen in case of that primary battery, if you can reverse that electrochemical reaction by passing a current through the battery, then you have what is called a rechargeable battery. In case of discharge, electrons are flowing in this particular direction, direction of current here, opposite to that. And then if you pass a current through the system, you will be able to reverse the flow of the electrons to the other electrode. That is how all rechargeable batteries work. The first and most successful rechargeable battery until recently was the lead acid battery. The idea for that was proposed by German scientist Willem Josef Sinstern in 1854. An actual lead acid battery was constructed in the year 1859 by the French scientist Gaston Plante. <clears throat> lead acid battery is, as I mentioned, is a rechargeable battery. It has a cathode made of lead oxide and the anode is metallic lead. They use porous lead for uh, ease of transportation of the ions. The electrolyte used in a lead battery is concentrated sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid with a concentration of about 64%. So 64% acid and 36% percent pure water is the electrolyte. Once the discharging process is complete, you know, both electrodes actually will turn into lead sulfate. But if you charge it again, you can reverse the electrochemical reaction in that. Lead acid batteries are great for your 
automobiles. In fact, these are die-hard components of most of your cars. However, they are not good for portable electronic devices for obvious reasons. Imagine that your cell phone used lead acid battery. We can expect some of the following warning signs on your cell phone or the disclaimer that you receive when you buy your cell phone. Please don't tilt your phone while talking. Avoid putting your phone inside your pockets. Don't let children handle cell phones. It's a good one. I'm pretty sure many parents out there would wish this were really true. And those who are familiar with lead acid batteries know that the concentration of acid is a very critical component of those batteries. As you keep using it, you know, water evaporates from that. So the acid concentration goes up. For normal lead acid batteries, you have to maintain this periodically by adding distilled water onto that. So for the last warning for your cell phone will be the following. Please be careful while pouring water on your cell phones for battery usage. For us, the most important part are the following characteristics for a rechargeable battery. Quantity known as specific energy. How much energy per kilogram does your storage battery have? The energy density, we will look at this particular number, how much energy, what, you know, watt hour per liter it can deliver, specific power and charge discharge efficiency. Typical lead acid battery can be used for about two to 300 charge discharge cycles. By that time, the battery electrodes will start corroding and you will have to replace the battery. Lead acid batteries, of course, as I mentioned, you know, still uh, people continue to use them in all automobiles. The next important development in storage battery came toward the end of 19th century by a Swedish inventor called Ernst Waldemar Jungde. He is the one who invented all these nickel-based batteries in that year. All of them came at the same time nickel iron, nickel cadmium, and silver cadmium batteries. Just for the sake of completion, I'm showing you the pictures. You know, nickel iron battery has the iron anode. Nickel in the form of nickel oxyhydroxide was used as the uh, cathode for this. This battery has the following characteristic. Energy density is low, just about 30 watt hour per liter. Charge discharge efficiency is about 65%. A huge improvement can be seen with the next nickel battery, which is the nickel cadmium battery. The anode in this case is cadmium. It has specific energy of 40 to 60 watt hour. The energy density is quite high, 50 to 150 charge discharge efficiency nearly 90%. The next generation battery in the nickel series came in the year 1967, developed by the car manufacturing industry in Europe. This is known as the nickel metal hydride battery. So here, uh, a nickel salt and then a hydrogen storage nickel containing alloy was used as the negative electrode. Uh, the battery performance is impressive in terms of the energy density, 140 to 300 watt hour per liter. However, these batteries had a very important drawback. They used to discharge even when the batteries were not being used. This is known as a self-discharge one third of the charge would disappear per every month when the battery was stored. So nickel-based batteries were far better compared to lead acid battery, but still suffered from limited energy densities and capacities. Search continued for 
better target material. Most of the people working in the area of battery research already knew where to look for because everybody had access to the secret document known as the periodic table of elements. So here comes lithium metal. Those who have seen the periodic table know that lithium is element number three in the periodic table. It has three electrons, two electrons in the 1s orbital and the third electron in the 2s orbital. During chemical reactions, lithium gives up that electron. Lithium is an electropositive metal and it becomes lithium ion. Lithium was identified in the form of lithium salt in the year 1870 by two Swedish scientists, Johann August Arthurson and Jons Jakob Versilius. They were not able to uh, separate lithium at that time. So with atomic number three, lithium is the lightest metal with a density of only 0.53 grams per centimeter cube. See the importance of that. You can pack a lot of lithium atom in unit volume, just half of the density of water. The low standard reduction potential, remember the active series table which I showed you, lithium has the standard reduction potential, the lowest in that series, negative 3.5 volt versus a standard hydrogen electrode, thus making it suitable for high density, high voltage battery cells. So these excellent properties of lithium were also the drawback of lithium. Lithium is a very reactive metal. It has to be protected from water and air. Remember, all the previous battery configurations that I have shown, the electrolytes were all water-based electrolytes. But if you are to use lithium as a component of your battery, you cannot have a water-based electrolyte for that one. So taming of lithium was the most important challenge for battery development at that particular stage. There are some milestones. 1958, William Harris showed that organic solvents can be used as electrolytes. Some of them are listed here, dimethyl carbonate, ethyl carbonate, and propylene carbonate. Some of these are still used in the present day battery. 1969, a very important uh, work by Yao and Kumar, who showed that sodium ions can move in solid electrolytes at the same rate as in salt smell. Think about the importance of this particular discovery. If you have solid electrolytes, you can tilt your cell phone when you are talking. So with that, the idea moved to using uh, lithium in your storage batteries. General understanding was that metallic lithium should serve as the anode for this battery. So the task was to find a matching cathode for that purpose. So scientists were looking for materials that can accommodate lithium ions at a high transfer rate. The idea came from some of the material scientists. This particular property known as intercalation was utilized for the purpose of lithium battery. Intercalation means this is the type of chemical reaction where one type of atoms can go and sit in a layered compound, a layered compound where different layers are there in the space between layers. That process is called intercalation. Walter Rudolph in 1965 suggested the use of titanium disulfide. This is a metal chalcogenide. Chalcogenides are compounds made with metals and the chalcogens of the periodic table, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. This is this cartoon depicts 
the intercalation mechanism which i told you these are you know the this is a layered compound with lot of space in between lithium atoms can actually go and stay in that say for example during the discharge phase of your storage battery and when you apply a, a voltage or pass current through that you can push this lithium ions back to the anode part of the material so here comes stanley whittingham born in nottingham uk in 1941 phd from university of oxford 1968 immediately after his phd he came to united states as a postdoctoral researcher at the university of stanford he was there for two years and <clears throat> after he finished his postdoctoral stay he took up a job with uh, exxon until 1988 since 1988 he has been a professor of chemistry and director of the institute of material science at state university of new york in binghamton new york one of our physics major students last year actually joined the material research program maddy will see for her phd in 1970s uh, whittingham came up with the material lithium titanium sulfide x you know this uh, is a number which is lying between 0 and 1 and he immediately constructed a lithium ion storage battery the anode of that was lithium the cathode used was titanium disulfide battery could operate at a potential of 2 volts and the electrolyte used was a salt of lithium dissolved in propylene carbonate you know avoid using water with some slight modifications of this this had a pm of 2.5 volts exxon developed a commercial lithium storage battery only with very slight modifications again lithium anode lithium disulfide as cathode and lithium perchlorate dissolved in dioxane as the electrolyte the battery could operate for 1100 cycles of charge discharge and this was an explosive development in the field of battery literally an explosive development because during the charging of such a battery when lithium ions are coming back to the anode to get deposited as lithium scientists observed that you know like the uh, stalagmites growth that you have seen in certain cages the lithium atoms which are coming back to the anode started growing like with tree like protrusions known as dendrites and sometimes they could bridge the battery electrode as shown in this particular cartoon these whiskers will start growing they will penetrate the barrier between the positive and negative half and they might even reach the cathode of the battery and that will create a short circuit and most of you know that short circuit offers a path with very le very small amount of resistance for the flow of electrons that produces high current even though the resistance is small the joule heating is proportional to i square so this produces huge amount of heat is generated with an organic solvent that would immediately generate the fire nation uh, graphics not only that it caught fire in most cases the battery exploded at the same time parallelly work was going in identifying better cathode materials that was done by john d goodenough John Goodenough, born in Vienna, Germany, 1922. He is old. He is really ancient. Yeah? To American parents, 
He graduated from Yale as a math major and did his PhD in solid state physics from where else? The University of Chicago. He worked at MIT and University of Oxford in UK before he came back to United States, took up a, the job of a professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science. He has been there since 1986. Early 90s, when I was a graduate student, Dr. Goodenough visited Indian Institute of Science and he looked exactly like this at that time. Too. He and his co workers at Oxford University in 1980 discovered that lithium cobaltate can be used as a cathode material for lithium and batteries. It was a very important development because this is still the cathode used in modern day lithium uh, ion batteries. The EMF increased to about four volts. However, he still used lithium metal as the anode. So commercialization was still a dream. It was not possible to you know, produce uh, this lithium ion batteries in large scale. So the trouble, is with lithium. Then came the next idea. The idea is based on what is known as ion transfer cells. So people gave up their attempt on taming the animal. No metallic lithium anode. Instead, try to use both electrodes made from intercalation materials that can accommodate lithium ions. So during charging phase, Lithium ions will go from one intercalation compound to the other while discharging. It will be going back to the original uh, cathode or anode. So this kind of shuttling configuration is known as a rocking chair battery configuration. One of, of the most well-known intercalation host material is graphite. Most people know that graphite is a layered compound and you can easily incorporate different types of atoms in the space between the layers of graphite. However, when they made this uh, new ion transfer cell with graphite anode, they faced some serious trouble because the electrochemical uh, components actually started reacting. They also started getting intercalated into the layers of graphite and graphite layers started coming out. This is known as exfoliation of the anode. So that started destroying the anode and spoiling the electrolyte. So that problem was solved by uh, the third Nobel laureate in this group, Professor Akira Yoshino, born in Osaka, the second largest city in Japan in 1948, went to Kyoto University, did his BS and MS in chemistry. He did his PhD in electrochemistry from Osaka University. And he joined the chemical company Asahi Kasei in 1985. Currently, he also serves as a professor at Meijo University in Nagoya, Japan. He made a very important discovery. He came up with an anode material, which is which was very safe to use in lithium ion batteries and showed higher potential than lithium. It is such a surprise that the anode material that he came up with is this material known as petroleum co. This is in fact a waste material which comes as a byproduct from the oil refining industry. This is a carbon rich solid material byproduct, which is thrown away from refineries. So he was able to construct a lithium ion storage battery with petroleum co as the anode, cobalt oxide as the anode, uh, the cathode. And immediately his uh, company, 
transferred that knowledge to Sony. And in 1991, Sony started commercial production of lithium ion storage battery. So this was the first battery that they made. Petroleum coke as anode, lithium cobalt oxide as cathode, LiPF6 uh, dissolved in propylene carbonate as the electrolyte. Battery had an EM of 3.7, very good specific charge, 200 watt power per liter. So if you look at the growth of storage battery, starting with lead acid storage battery, nickel cadmium improved uh, to nickel metal hydrate, lithium ion, lithium metal of course has better properties, but safety is a big concern. I did not mention about polymer lithium ion. This is a battery that uses a solid polymer as the electrolyte uh, for the lithium ion batteries. With that came the Nobel Prize uh, announcement. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2019 was awarded to John B. Goodenow. M. Stanley Whittingham and Akira Yoshino for their contributions to the development of the lithium ion battery. Now we will watch the award ceremony, the Nobel Prize award ceremony. The actual ceremony itself is a very long process. It takes about 75 minutes. I know the present TikTok generation will not have patience to watch 75 minute long video at any time. However, I would strongly recommend anybody with some enthusiasm in science to go ahead and watch this video. You know, it is very nicely done. Plenty of excellent music. The orchestra is amazing there. There are some customs. Each Nobel laureate can bring up to 14 guests to this particular ceremony. The Nobel prizes are awarded uh, by the King of Sweden. They still have kings. Okay, here we go. So we will watch just two minutes of this. John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham, and Akira Yoshino. You have made groundbreaking discoveries in chemistry that has led to the development of the lithium ion battery. This is a truly great achievement for the benefit of humankind. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations. May I now ask you to step forward and receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. And first to receive the prize is John B. Goodenough, American born in Germany, uh, affiliated with the University of Texas in the United States. He is now at the age of 97, the oldest laureate ever to receive the prize. Now, from the hands of His Majesty the King of Sweden. Mr. Price is awarded with one third each to John Goodenough and also Stanley Whittingham. Next laureate to step forward, born in the United Kingdom, affiliated with Binghamton University, State University of New York. Professor Whittingham is here in Stockholm, accompanied by his family, including his wife, Georgina Judith Whittingham, two children, grandchildren, colleagues and friends.
Dr. Akira Yoshino from Japan is affiliated with the Meiyo University of Nagoya, Japan. Yoshino is here in Stockholm with his wife Kumiko Yoshino, their two daughters and significant others. And we stop it Okay, at this moment, let me spend a few minutes on the branch of science, what we call material science, which contributed to so many important developments in the field of technology. Lithium ion battery is the result of decades of research in the area of material science. This is an interdisciplinary area involving physics, chemistry, and engineering. Major industries rely on the research outputs in material science to develop novel products and technologies. Future outlook. Battery research is still a very active area. New cathode materials, these are known as final compounds, lithium manganate, lithium iron phosphate, both were discovered by John Goodenough's research in UT Austin. New solid electrolytes were discovered. So now graphite is back as the anode in the present day uh, lithium ion battery. EMF increased to 4.2 volts and energy density of the order of 400 watt hour per liter. Tesla last December, 2020 December, revealed the latest battery that they use for the Tesla Model S. This is a 100 kilowatt battery pack. The previous ones, they were using 60 or 70 kilowatt battery pack. Tesla claims that this, with this particular battery pack, Model S can run after one full charge a range of 370 miles, and the battery has not shown any deterioration in performance even after 1,000 cycles. So that makes you know 370,000 miles, which normal cars will not last most of the time. Again, battery cost and charging time are challenging issues for electric cars. Looking at the availability of these elements uh, used in the uh, fabrication of lithium ion batteries. Lithium is pretty good abundance, you know, compared to uh, whatever scale that I have shown here. The typical abundances of uh, gold and platinum is of the order of 10 to the minus three. So lithium is, you know, almost like 100,000 more. Uh, large, I mean, 100,000 larger abundances for lithium. The only concern here is the availability of cobalt, you know, which is one of the lowest here at present. Cobalt is uh, mined predominantly from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a very poor African nation. So multinational companies using the cheap local labor, they dig up for uh, cobalt, uh, mine it and sell it for very high price in the international uh, market. Also, uh, local people, including children, using handheld tools, try to dig up uh, cobalt without any safety precautions and they try to sell it in, in the market. That is a, a matter of concern. Otherwise, most of the materials are available in, in plenty. Uh, one thing which we still need is a robust recycling plan for lithium ions. 
move away from fossil fuel. This is a solar farm right next to Cochin International Airport, which is just about 25 miles away from the village where I grew up. This is the first major airport in the world to get all of its electricity from uh, renewable source like solar power. Not only that, the whole airport operation is from this solar farm. They provide electricity for <clears throat> all the nearby villages too. Coming back to home here in Macomb, some of you have seen the new wind farm north of US 67, Cardinal Point Wind Farm in McDonough County. The wind farm is in fact one of the fastest growing industries in the state of Illinois. Both wind and solar are great renewable energy sources. Both are weather dependent. If there is no wind, the wind turbines will not move. If there is no sun, solar power won't generate any electricity. So safe and affordable battery technology has to be part of this renewable energy sources because when energy is available in plenty, the produced energy must be stored in such huge storage battery so that you know when energy is not produced, you will get continuous supply using these batteries. Challenges still remain. Some of these challenges all of us face as battery users in our everyday life. With that remark, I conclude this presentation. Thank you all for joining. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Babu, for a wonderful presentation. Let's open it up for questions. Uh, let's start the questions. Now, please uh, start putting your questions in the chat window. And then here in a little bit, we, can, we may even open it up for uh, direct conversation. Okay, so I, so far I don't have any questions in the chat. I want to ask you one question uh, to give some time for our audience to start typing their questions. So Dr. Babu, in about 2016, in a few years back, we heard this story about Samsung cell phones catching fire. And so uh, they were not letting people carry those on the airplanes. Can you tell us what, uh, uh, what was the reason behind? Uh... There are two versions behind the reason. <laughs> One version given by Samsung which, you know, not really telling us what exactly happened there. Samsung just made the statement that there was a defect in the, man, uh, the battery manufacturing. Obviously there was a defect, you know, that is why it <laughs> started catching fire. The real reason is that, you know, the competition that exists between Apple and Samsung. Samsung always wanted to come up one step ahead of Apple so they came up with a model of the cell phone with a battery with very large capacity. You know, so much of lithium was packed into that battery. Remember, even in these storage batteries, there is movement of charged particles and there is always electrical resistance for that. So when you design these batteries, you have to design in such a way that this heat generated due to the motion of these ions must be duly dissipated. As such, lithium batteries present us with a challenge. You know that this lithium batteries, when you are charging it, if it gets overcharged, those batteries can explode. So all the lithium batteries which you have in your, your you know, portable devices, they all have a protection circuit which detects the charging level to stop it beyond a particular one. So this Samsung batteries, of course, they had protection levels, but the density of lithium ion was so high that the heat dissipation mechanism could not handle it. That is which, you know, led. So in a sense, their explanation was true. It was a manufacturing defect. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, thank you very much for that detailed uh, explanation that, that uh, tells us quite a bit uh, that with high energy storage density, you know, come uh, these uh, challenges that you need to always keep at the back of your mind. We have one question from Dr. Malur actually, how toxic are these batteries? Yeah, these, you know, lithium ion batteries uh, are not as toxic as the nickel cadmium batteries. Nickel cadmium batteries were very, very toxic batteries. So if you do not throw away these batteries, if you, you know, put them really into a proper recycling place, you should be fine with uh, lithium ion batteries. Okay, we have uh, one more question. Uh, do these batteries have a self-discharge rate? And what is the self-discharge rate in comparison with other batteries? Okay. So I mentioned that nickel metal hydride batteries, you know, self-discharge was a big issue, 30% self-discharge. For most lithium batteries, the self-discharge is less than 3%. So it is not an issue with uh, lithium ion battery. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat window. Uh, Dr. Araja has raised his hand, so yeah, yeah. Uh, we Go will ahead. just uh, let him speak. Yep, please. Very nice talk, uh, Babu. Thank you. Uh, so, actually, question about other types of, of, of batteries or, or technologies. So, so things like uh, like fuel cells, like hydrogen cells. Uh, what what type of future do you see for for that technology? Um, also, uh, years ago, I heard kind of the possibility of, of uh, artificial photosynthesis, right? Uh, to try kind of those those basically synthesize gasoline as it would be kind of the equivalent, right? So what are your thoughts on those other things? Okay, so my thought on fuel cells, you know, before uh, joining here, I actually did work on some uh, catalyst uh, development of fuel cells. The main concern with fuel cells, uh, of course, excellent source of energy, you know, there is no pollution because you are burning hydrogen with that. The trouble is that Hydrogen being the most abundant element in the universe, it is a rare gas on our planet. We don't have much hydrogen. You know, whatever hydrogen that we get from air, you cannot extract hydrogen because very small amount of hydrogen that we have in our atmosphere. Currently, for all industrial purposes, hydrogen is obtained from uh, some natural gas, uh, you know, deposits. Which so methane is part of that you have to extract hydrogen from those natural gas deposits. So those, the nitrogen, the hydrogen that we get with this natural gas, these are contaminated. So the proper operation of your fuel cell, you need really, really highly purified hydrogen. So purification of hydrogen is an energy expensive job. So if you spend so much of money in producing this fuel, it will not be uh, energetically viable to burn that fuel. So if you can get cheap hydrogen, then fuel cell is definitely the way to go. Then uh, I don't know much about the actual, you know, artificial production of gasoline. Again, my concern with that will be the energy intensive nature of that kind of reaction. So right now, we are using gasoline, which was made by nature in about 400 million years of time, you know, through photosynthesis, this uh, fuel was made. All we do, just dig it up and burn it. In 200 years time, we will finish burning the whole deposit. I think Daniel has a question about the mileage of Tesla battery, 370 miles per full charge. That is what they're claim for. Yes, Tesla battery is lithium based. Uh, Elon Musk has uh, made a statement that uh, Tesla is going to come up with a million mile battery, mm -hmm. you know, a battery which can run on a car until the car completes 1 million miles. That's their next target. Okay, we have a question from our alumni, Mr. Balkholder. What is the outlook for decreasing the recharge time for electric automobiles? This is, you know, Clay, this is a very important point. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing with electric vehicles, okay? 
So you want, you know, even with all this nice mileage, which uh, Tesla is claiming for a single charge, full charging takes about 78 hours. Even with the best uh, supercharging facility, it is going to take about one hour right now to charge it to full. So how this will fit into your travel schedule, you know, when you stop there at your charging station, you may probably have to plan for lunch and, you know, it definitely an hour has to be spent at that time so that your car can be charged fully. Daniel, 1 million mile at one full, no, no, not 1 million mile at one full charge, 1 million mile for the lifetime of the battery. Yeah, we have a longest question from uh, Riley. Uh, does the US have sufficient domestic production of the materials that go into lithium ion batteries or do they need to come from overseas? Uh, could the supply be cut off if we have trade disagreements? Okay. Lithium is available all around the world, but mainly lithium is currently coming from the salt deposit in Atacama Desert. So that has to come from South America. And as I told you, cobalt, which is an important ingredient, that has to come from Africa. So yes, if there are trade agreements, uh, disagreements, we will uh, run into difficulties. Okay, we have another follow-up comment from uh, uh, Clay. Uh, the, older yeah. I get, the longer my travel breaks are, so this may be good for me. <laughs> It may be, it may, we might improve, Clay, you know, we might definitely come up with uh, better charging technology so that it can be done in 30 minutes. You know, 70% of charge, if you can get in 30 minutes, you will be good. Yeah, I heard at some point there was an alternate uh, model they were looking at that you would just uh, go into a, uh, uh, you know, sort of like a charging place, but they would have these battery packs uh, pre-charged. Yeah. So all you have to do is replace your battery pack and then off you go in two minutes, which would be probably faster than even fueling, you know, filling up your tank with, with gasoline fuel. Yeah. So you have to, but develop that necessary infrastructure for that purpose, you know, place with that many number of, so, but right now, if you look at the battery, for the Tesla, the battery is on the floor of the car. Well, you know, if, um, for physicists, we don't have to say that's the most stable position, right? For <laughs> to have the heavy stuff at the bottom. At the uh, bottom. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Anybody? Go ahead and ask away. Uh, I wanted to ask about. I heard a few years back. Uh, that uh, there are these tremendous amount of challenges in uh, recycling the lithium-ion batteries. And you, you, you did mention that in the talk. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what are the challenges or do we even have we mechanics don't, we don't right really, now? Yeah, we don't really have a robust recycling plan for lithium. Right now, all the lithium batteries are made from fresh lithium, which is being mined. Very bad idea. Yeah, maybe Tesla needs to be uh, pushed to the corner because they are the ones bringing in so many uh, lithium-ion batteries uh, uh, out in the open. Uh, they should be responsible for recycling them as well. Yeah. What is the normal size of the lithium-ion batteries? How big or how small we can have? Oh, there are very small ones, you know, like uh, the typical button-type cells that you have. You have lithium ion batteries of that size. The large one you have seen is the one for the car at the floor of the car is currently the largest. But when we have to come up with the storage batteries to take care of the buffering of your solar and wind energy, you know, you can come up with much larger size. Their weight of the battery is not an issue because those are not portable applications. You know, you can have your battery sitting right next to your wind farm. So alternate technologies like technologies involving say sodium ion can be developed for that purpose. So yeah, can I'm... you mention a couple of uh, research institutions where they are working on the lithium ion uh, battery? 
lithium ion battery in uh, Argonne National Lab. There is a huge lithium ion battery uh, program is there. The places which I mentioned for the Nobel laureates, University mm -hmm. of uh, Texas at Austin, they have a very good program. Then uh, Binghamton, where uh, Maddie Wilsey joined for the PhD last year, they have an Institute of Material Science where battery ion program, uh, battery research program is going on in full swing. Uh, Los Alamos, they have a battery mm -hmm. development program, National Lab. Okay. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Babu. So let's do the ritual of uh, thanking our speaker. So all of you unmute your mics <coughs> and, and let's thank you, thank Dr. Babu for a wonderful presentation. And, and uh, I especially like the history part, you know, the history is important. That's how we uh, develop knowledge and learn. And it's, it's always useful to yeah, and uh, it, it took so many decades and contributions from so many people, you know, even though all of them did not get Nobel Prize, so many brains worked to, to the current day uh, lithium ion technology. And that's an important message for the students. You know, you may feel like you are overworked and you're working really hard, uh, spending a lot of time on, on a small project, but it is part of this, you know, much larger picture and eventually it will get uh, applied to a real life problem. So it's uh, uh, something to, to think about. Okay, wonderful. Any other questions for Dr. Babu? I want to mention one interesting thing that I learned very recently and quite saddening actually. We are talking about these renewable energy sources and you know solar farms and wind farms. It turns out for the wind turbines, the blades they make uh, normally, we tout these uh, facilities to have a life of about 30 years or so. The blades for the wind, uh, uh, you know, wind turbines, they don't last that very long. You know, if they last only about three or four years and they are made from some sort of a strange polymer that's not even biodegradable. So they are actually filling up landfills. So extremely sad. Uh, and I, I wasn't aware of it. I, I did not know that either. I thought these were made from some metal. No, oh. no. So it's not metal. It's a, it's a it's a polymer and it's a recycling nightmare. They are just going into landfills, not even being recycled. So extremely sad. I mean, we are talking about renewables and and protecting the environment and such, but the technologies that are being used, they were not developed, uh, at least in this particular case, uh, with uh, sufficient care. Yeah, as you said, it's sad to hear that. Okay, Clay, you have raised your hand, so go ahead. Uh, I just, one thing that was interesting, that my, one of my areas of expertise in petroleum refining was the coker that makes the petroleum coke. And uh, in Illinois, we ran a lot of Canadian crudes, which uh, made the coke a very unusable. Uh, the petroleum coke was what we called the sponge coke. So. Uh, do you know, you know, as the world moves towards the lower grade crudes, it's going to move away from that anode grade coke. Do you know how much of that anode grade coke goes into, into these batteries? I mean, is that something that's going to be maybe a shortage also? No, well, right now we have completely moved back to graphite as oh. the anode. Okay. And graphite, I presume, is pretty abundant. It is pretty abundant, yeah. Okay, very good. Everybody is quiet. This is your opportunity to open up your mic and ask questions. Okay. Very... So you also learned some trivia today. You know, the oldest <laughs> person to get a Nobel Prize is John Goodenough. 97. <laughs> I, I don't know if the audience noticed, but I liked all of your jokes, Dr. Babu. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, we were laughing, actually. <laughs> I actually wanted the neighbor's car. I said, okay, how about the robot? Neighboring island. <laughs> like, Thank you. 
yeah some of the jokes i found on the internet some of them i modified some of them i really created i like the one with bipolar that was oh. <laughs> bipolar and die hard <laughs> yeah okay very good i see that meghna is on the call yep okay i'm going to 